And welcome back after morning tea. Everybody, we're going to start our next talk now. Your next speaker is William. Take it away, William. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is William Brown, and I'm a senior software engineer at SUSE. And software engineer isn't really a title that I feel gets presented much at conferences to do with InfoSec. So that means that I have the great joy of talking to you today about the fact that programming is really hard, OK? And it's an insane job to work in. And you know, many of you would probably experience this from the InfoSec side in seeing things like vulnerabilities and CVEs and stuff. But that's not all there is to it. When it comes to programming, you have a lot to think about. You have to think about release schedules. You have to think about maintainability of your code. You have to think about social awareness and impacts of what I'm doing. I have to think about business requirements, the user experience. Can I debug it in the future? Will I be able to work out what past William did and what future William can fix it? Um, can I share all this knowledge with my team? Can I document it? Is it supportable? Do we have upgrade and downgrade paths? Do we have backups, restores, disaster recovery capabilities? What about our API stability for people who are using and developing plugins? What about performance? Terrible language limitations. I'm sure that every single programming language has these, as well as third-party libraries having their own limitations as well. And finally, we now get into robustness of will it crash and security of will it be hacked. So what is robust software? Robust software is software that is capable of performing without failure under a wide range of conditions. And security is an element of this. Security is generally comes, uh, so insecurity comes as a result of failings in software to be robust. So every security issue is a fault, but not every fault is a security issue. So how can we make things that perform without failure in a huge range of conditions? Well, it turns out we have systems like this in our houses already. We have microwaves. They're all over the world. They exist in many languages, and they all have the capability to do huge amounts of harm to a human body. They have to be robust else people get hurt. Things could be on fire. So I decided to write a microwave in a programming language to see how it would go. And it went about exactly as well as, well as you expect. So the first thing I did is I wrote a microwave testing framework. And, and I did this all in Rust, because Rust is a safe language, right? You can't make mistakes in Rust. So let's talk about my failures. So here was my first failure as I started to write my code. I forgot to check the door was closed when you press start. So I would just turn on the magnetron and set you on fire. This is not what we want. Now my second failure. This one was a little bit more subtle and took me a bit of time to work out. But I wasn't counting time properly. So when the microwave went to zero, it just kept running and running and running. So your food would be very warm maybe on fire. Look, I told you that programming was hard. And I haven't even gotten into all of like the release schedule of my microwave. So let's back up for a second. How does a microwave work? There's a set of possible events that can occur. These are defined inputs. We can open the door. We can close the door. We can press start. We can press stop. We can set a time. OK, yeah, sure, this is a bit of a contrived, contrived microwave. But we have a defined set of inputs. Now, we have to only write software that acts upon these events. We don't need to do anything else beyond that. And because of there's a finite set of events that can occur, we can model these. And from these, we can actually talk about what states the microwave can exist in. The door can be open with no time set. The door can be open with a time set. The door could be closed with no time set. The door could be closed with a time. And the door could be closed with a time set and cooking. So, Notice that there's no state where the door is open and we're also cooking. This is really important for defining things that are important to safety, that we can actually say, yeah, look, here it is. It only cooks when the door is closed. So we can turn this into a table now. And we can take all of our possible inputs and all of our possible states, and we can map them all out. So from every state the microwave is in, given an input, we can then translate this to what the next state the microwave will be in. So to make this a little bit easier, and I know that it's small, especially at distance, there's online versions of this. Just to help out, I allied the, the states where we stay in the same thing. Basically, a no-op occurs. 
So now that we've written our set of transitions, well, now we have a really good model for what can actually occur within our system and how we achieve that. We can even turn this into pretty pictures. Everyone loves pictures. Now, this diagram is showing every state that exists as a circle and the transitions or events occurring as an edge on the graph. So again, I've skipped events that stay in the same state. They'd just be loops back into the same circle. So now that we've defined a state machine, let's try writing our code again. So the first example I have is in Rust. So one of the ways that you can do this with Rust is you can actually define all of your states as an enumeration. So here I've listed all of the possible states as an enumeration, and each of them can have subparameters such as the, the existence of time or not. When you use this in Rust, the match statement is exhaustive. So when an action occurs via the function, you check what state you are in, and then you can see, based on all possible states, we can then pick what is the next state that we move into, and we can actually define, OK, yeah, we've handled every single possible case here. So an example here is that when we are pressing the Start button and the door is closed with no time, we now move to a state where the microwave is on with 30 seconds. This is generally what happens with your microwave at home if you just close the door and press Start. So I've also demonstrated how to do this in C. Now, it's 2019. Please don't write new projects in C. C is really hard to get right. But if you still have to maintain C code, like certain unfortunate people standing in front of you right now, there are strategies you can use to help improve your chances at success. And one of these is, again, state machines. So here we can define an enum again. It's a good trick with C to define your initial state as zero. So when you do a C alloc, it just puts everything into the initial state. And from having this enum, you can make that a field on a structure. And again, now you can do a case switch statement. And case switch is not exhaustive in C. So you need to be careful to make sure that you've gone through and checked everything properly. But it's still a lot better than tangled if statements. And in this case, again, the microwave, when we press start, we go from closed with no time to closed running and set the time to 30. So let's talk about some other approaches where you can use state machines. Sorry, let me back up for a second. Both the Rust version and the C version actually compiled and passed my full test suite on the very first go. And that's why defining these models is so useful, is you can actually have a lot of confidence in what you're building and very provably, before you even compile and run the code, know that it will do the right thing. Anyway, so. There's some other ways we can approach this as well. This was all runtime state machines. Maybe you need a state machine at compile time. Maybe you need to be able to say that my data flows through my program in a very specific way. Now, this version I use with Rust is a compiled version. I think with generics, you can probably do something similar, maybe with Java, Haskell, TypeScript, similar. So you'll need to adapt that for yourself. But the way you do this is you define empty structures. And these structures are your states. And when you um, uh, have something that has data, you again, you can define a structure now with a field. When, what happens is that this is added as a generic parameter on your structure. And so you're, you'll end up with a whole bunch of different implementations of microwave in each different state. But it's checked at compile time, because these are types. So when you act on the microwave, you return a new instance of it at each point. And so, and that new instance has an updated state field or a state type, because it's type-based type at this point. And that way, we can only have valid actions. So in this case, the microwave is open with a, with a time set. And we can, so the door is open with a time set. And you can close the door, but in this list, there's no open door function. It's not valid to try and open the door again when it's already open. You literally cannot compile code where you actually try to open the door when the microwave is already open, because that's not available on this instance of microwave with that set of generics. You'll also see that when we have an action occur like the closed door, we are returning a new microwave in a new state with a new set of internal structures. So what ends up happening is your code ends up looking a little bit like this, where you get new microwaves all the time. and you know, these actions exist. But again, you can't compile in actions that don't exist. And as your code flows 
through these set of functions, such as um, the uh, closed door, you say open, and it will go to open with no time. Then you set a time, and then it goes to the open time state. What's really cool about a lot of languages, so Rust and some others, is that because these are empty structures, all the structures have the same fields in them, they actually will compile all of this away. This is only at compile time that it needs to be known, and when it's compiled away, your structure ends up becoming like a single use size in this case. So it's actually very efficient to write code like this. So this isn't really probably the best thing for microwaves because microwaves are really dynamic with human interaction, but where this strategy can be really great is databases. So you've got a, uh, an entry that needs to go through a series of validation steps. Well, at each point of validation, you can change the state, and then you can define a set of state transitions through that entry's lifecycle, and at compile time, assert, yeah, actually, I've done the right thing. And it means that if you try to hand an entry that hasn't been validated to your backend, it will not compile the code because you haven't put it through the right set of sequences. And this is really cool. So you may also be wondering, well, OK, I don't have my new shiny code base. I've just got what I've got. Well, there's states in everything around you in your code. All of your types have some kind of state and represent that. So like an option type or a maybe type has a sum value and a num value. These are two possible states that it can exist in. You can have C types, which this is conflating returns and types and values and things, but null versus any other value is a, something you can check. Booleans can have true or false. Numbers can be 0, 1, or any other value, so they're infinite. So when we start to think about this, we can start to think about what states our functions exist in and how we have to handle that data. So if we have a function like this, which is type A Boolean, B option, C use size, how many possible states are here? Well, based on all of the types of inputs and what I said on the last slide, there are 12 possible states this function can exist in. But now, if we start to add some bound checking, such as if not A, B is none, C is zero, suddenly we've now eliminated states from our function. There can only be two valid states that allow our function to continue, and we return on all others. So this is a different way of modeling states and the state machine. This is the difference between a deterministic state machine and a non-deterministic one. So if we actually decided to turn this into a pretty picture and, and deal with this, uh, you would end up with something like this. So far, the microwave I talked about, that's a deterministic state machine. But now we're going to talk about non-deterministic ones. So a non-deterministic one, you don't list all possible inputs. You only list valid inputs. And any other input automatically implies that the machine crashes or goes to an error state. So on the left, we have a non-deterministic state machine. Given the input of the letter A, we go to our initial state of A. The next time we get an input, which is the letter B, we then move to the state AB because we have matched those two. If we were given any other letter like C at the start or anywhere else, we go and crash into an error state. We can take these and actually compile them to deterministic versions, but of course they explode wildly in size and complexity. And this is what is on the right. This is the same state machine, but in a deterministic form. Given the input A, we move to state A. Given any other input, we move to the error state. Similar for B to AB. And then, in fact, subsequent input to AB will also go to the error state. So we can start, so you can actually start to think about your functions like this. And then you can say, well, OK, here are all of the valid execution paths and states that my code can go through. For those keen-eyed people who are looking, this is a regex. And it turns out that regexes are actually non-deterministic finite state automata. So every time you're debugging a regex, you can just think, yeah, I just need to debug this state machine. This makes total sense. Anyway, so this is all really cool and all. But what helps is doing it. So I have actually written up a very extensive tutorial complete with sample code and all of my code. This will be made available through the great archive. Um, and it, it allows you to go through, you can fork it. There are harnesses, like fill in the blank versions for both Rust and C. You'll have my example of the, I call it the spaghetti wave, but it's the naive one that set people on fire to start with. So you can just see just how bad my code was until I fixed it. And I also have my implementations of how it's done with the enumerations in Rust and C 
and also the compiled version. So all of these examples are there, and there is a completely worked tutorial, including how to generate the tables, how to work, how to generate the graphs, uh, the pictures, all there online. So that's the URL. It'll be handed out with the archive as well. So if you want, go home and actually try it out yourself. Fork it, try and run it, build it, and see how you go making these machines. I'm also very happy to help out with this. My Twitter is Erstiara, um, or first year is probably an easy way to find me. My email is wbrown at suza.de. I'm very happy to answer questions, help, talk about this, come and find me afterwards. And I really hope that this gives you some ideas about how you can think about your programs, and about the way that you think about how your code works, how it flows, how people interact with it, and about how actually you can model all of your functions, even at a basic level, to make them more robust. So you can define what are the possible things that go wrong, what are the things that can go right. There are other types of state machine models you can go and research from here, such as the Mealy Moore machines, and there's some other more complicated ones like that but they all will help you define how your program works to help you understand what you're writing before it gets into the hand of those nasty pen testers and all of their, their tricks. So I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy this most sparkly of conference. <laughs>